For some people, they develop depression and anxiety before seizures start. And so there are other things that are happening in the brain before seizures start that we need to be thinking about. Fellow homo sapiens, now so many people diagnosed with an epilepsy and indeed their clinician often seek to find out the cause of their seizure onset and when it started happening. Well, today, hear from epileptologist Jacob Pellinen, who shares with us his research and results proving that people can experience things like learning difficulties at school or work before seizure onset. I am Jacob Pellinen. I'm a neurologist and epileptologist at the University of Colorado and an assistant professor with the School of Medicine. I have been doing a lot of research lately on uh, the Human Epilepsy Project, which is something I'll talk a little bit more about today. And that led to one of uh, a recent publication, uh, which is why I believe I was invited on this podcast. Indeed, um, it's a topic, in my opinion, not t uh, touched on enough, um, and like developing an epilepsy perhaps later on um, than one than people largely expect. Could you just tell us? Um, how did you, why did you decide to focus on the epilepsies? Because we need more of you and um, it's not quite a, a cool uh, sphere to work in as far as neurology goes quite yet. I went to medical school at the University of Colorado and kind of always knew I wanted to be a neurologist. Uh, what I was going to eventually gravitate towards, I hadn't figured out at that time, but as I started training in neurology um, and seeing all of the ways that seizures can present clinically and all the different treatments and the technology behind how we treat uh, seizures nowadays. It was really inspiring. And I ran into a couple of very inspiring people at NYU where I trained. And uh, that's how I got started down this whole pathway in both clinical care and research. So um, and I, I would encourage trainees to look into the field, and uh, it, it certainly is something where neuroscience meets medicine in very exciting ways and can be very inspiring. The sphere is not limited to seizures alone, right? It's, there's a lot more uh, often challenging a person with an epilepsy than solely seizures. Right. And, you know, you soon realize during your clinical training, even when you're focusing on things like seizures and epilepsy, that when your uh, goal is to take care of people, it involves recognizing a whole um, larger spectrum of potential issues and things that people are struggling with, anxiety, depression, and, and other issues going on in their lives that you need to think about. Well, let's go on to this paper of yours, which I, I read the whole shebang, which certainly takes a certain amount of concentration I don't always have. Um, so titled, um, this is quite long, but Later Onset Focal Epilepsy with Roots in Childhood, Evidence from Early Learning Difficulty and Brain Volumes in the Human Epilepsy Project. So tell us about that. Let me start by just briefly describing the Human Epilepsy Project, because it was mm. something and is something I've been doing research on for several years now. And it was a group of people with newly diagnosed and treated focal epilepsy. And uh, it recruited almost, almost 500 participants and followed everyone for at least three years and collected just a ton of information on um, their seizures, uh, starting with what led to their diagnosis, and then at the time of diagnosis, what treatments they were started on, their MRIs, their EEGs, and all of this other testing they got. And so when I started looking at this uh, data, I was interested in initially in the enrollment data and uh, what had led to people's diagnosis, how many seizures had they had, how long had things been going on. And some of the initial papers that I wrote on this were all based on that and how people can experience long delays to diagnosis and how people with subtle seizures, uh, seizures that aren't overt convulsions uh, can slip under the radar and not be recognized by uh, families and healthcare providers for long periods of time. Uh, so that was the first thing that I did. And then uh, separately, the imaging group with the Human Epilepsy Project had done an analysis and realized there was a group of people who had smaller brain volumes than other people. And we weren't sure why 
And so one of the things that I did was look at what, what factors could be associated with reduced brain volumes in, in the human epilepsy project. Is there a group of people who we don't understand their epilepsies very well yet or, or what's causing the seizures? And so that was kind of a whole area of investigation that led to this paper and is going to be leading to a lot more subsequent uh, uh, investigations after this. So this this current paper is is basically just the tip of the iceberg. We saw that there were uh, there was a change in brain volumes and and sought to kind of figure out why. And I would say the two the two things that I found most interesting about this analysis were number one when I looked at everybody's pre seizure uh, or pre diagnosis seizure histories. The, the number of seizures that people had in their, their seizure burden prior to being started on medications wasn't associated with any structural brain changes. So that was reassuring. Uh, you know, if people are having a lot of seizures and they get started on treatment, that's, early, that's still early enough to prevent anything like uh, focal atrophy of the temporal lobes and, and other things that we found in, in groups of people that have... Uh, seizures for much longer periods of time. And then the other thing that uh, was very interesting was that um, the, the one association that we found with structural brain abnormalities was uh, people reporting a history of learning difficulties in childhood or in school. And in retrospect, I, I find, you know, people will in, in clinic who I'm taking care of will mention things like struggling with in school and struggling with work prior to seizure onset. And we know that for some people that's that's the case. And, and for some people, they develop depression and anxiety before seizures start. And so there are other things that are happening in the brain before seizures start that we need to be thinking about. So, I mean... That this might sound random and uh, totally impossible, but is is there some way potentially that if we identify in a person that they seem to suddenly out of the blue be struggling on school or college, or they have a an onset of depression with no identified cause, could would it be worth speaking to a neurologist in that case? I mean, that happens to loads of people, doesn't it? So, I mean, how do you yeah. take those early signs and figure out if that may be an epilepsy or not, or do you just keep tuned and see if something else happens? Yeah, that's a challenging question, especially when you kind of overlay the healthcare resources question on top of that, and that, you know, lack <laughs> of uh, resources uh, in, well, particularly the numbers of neurologists and epileptologists in different regions. But I would say that though it's worth for any clinician to figure out, try to figure out what the underlying, underlying cause of of new onset symptoms are. And part of that, you know, part of what I would like to do over the course of my career is just increase the recognition of, of seizure symptoms and, and symptoms around seizures that are being under-recognized. Uh, a lot of focal seizures have subtle symptoms that tend to get under-diagnosed and under-recognized. And just recognizing those earlier can can make a big difference in people's lives. So I was on the tube today, I'd just gone to see a friend and I was thinking at the time for, for some reason that I remember having what I considered to be tiny little focal seizures um, years ago when I was just traveling, for instance, they would happen almost daily, but I didn't recognize that for what it was. And it wouldn't get brought up with a clinician. It was my neurologist. It was, and I was just like, well, that's just feeling a bit funny and it's no big deal. It's not a seizure. That was the presumption I had back in the day. And now in retrospect, I'm thinking, oh my God, that was, that was valuable information to record and convey to my neurologist. Absolutely agree. And, and it's a surprisingly common story. I, I see people in my clinic all the time who have, you know, come in, they're brought in, they're referred to me because of a larger convulsive seizure. And then when I'm getting into their history and talking about things with them, they'll 
realize, oh, I'm also having these other sensations that are that are short, lasting, sudden onset, strange, and they're all similar. And you know, that's really the hallmark of what a what a seizure is. If you don't feel what you consider to be normal and it feels a bit weird inside, it's worth bringing up, right? Definitely worth talking about. Um, I just wanted to clarify, before when you said learning disabilities, and um, sometimes I, I've, in different clinicians I speak to, there can be a bit of a confusion depending on, so, so if one says learning disabilities or intellectual disability, or both, mm -hmm. in your study, what could you just clarify whom you were referring to, who was involved? Yeah, the Human Epilepsy Project had pretty strict inclusion and exclusion criteria for that cohort. And they wanted to try to mitigate the effects of uh, significant developmental delays and uh, neurocognitive disorders on, on, on looking at seizure outcomes. So the study was designed to really look for biomarkers to assess for treatment responses. So they were trying to reduce confounding variables. And what makes that interesting is it's a relatively normal range of cognition. Everyone who took a test and had an IQ score below 70 was excluded from participating. So there's a broad range of cognitive functions, uh, but kind of essentially within that normal, normal range more or less. And so what I, what we looked at was a screening questionnaire and it's more what I would frame as learning difficulties than, than learning disabilities. Uh, so this was a patient reported data point in which people said, when I was in school, you know, I had to repeat a grade or I had to go to remediation for a subject, um, or, you know, I was diagnosed with a formal learning disability, like, uh, um, and there was a, a spectrum of them that they were asked about in other, other questionnaires, but kind of the presence of any one of those three things or combination of them, I, I put in a bucket of, well, they were having a hard time in school, more or less, and let's see if that correlates with anything, uh, because oftentimes, in, in when I talk to people in clinic, they they won't necessarily have had a formal diagnosis of something, but they can tell me, you know, they were really struggling with certain subjects, and memory was a problem, and depression was a problem, and so you get these kind of this this constellation of, of symptoms and. A question in my mind is people who have this or have this finding on their brain MRIs, are, are they more difficult to treat or do they respond to specific treatments better than others? And how can we more rapidly optimize people's care? And so that that's kind of the avenue for future investigation, jumping off of this study into the next well, thank you so much for the inspiration and um, I look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know about you, but I wanted to ask Jacob so many more questions. So do make sure that you keep an eye on his work. Links are on the website.